Oh, man. All right, should we get started? Yeah, we can do that. Oh, yeah, that's, I'm just busy, you know, <laughs> ice breaking over here. All right, uh, <laughs> let's see here. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, as mentioned, we have Chantilly Jagernoff on the call. Uh, she will be going over her dashboard design secrets. Um, before I hand the mic over to her, did want to go over just a few housekeeping items, so bear with me just a bit. Uh, also, hi, Ryan Fergus. Good to see you. I'm seeing names from blast from the past. Love it. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, yep, as mentioned, so giving most of the hour, we will um, leave some time at the end for Q&A, um, but really want to uh, focus on getting to the meat of this. As you know, we are your regular Portland Tableau user group leaders. Hello. Feel free to reach out to us as you feel fit. Um, we host these about once a month, uh, typically on Thursdays. Uh, the next coming one will be on April 21st. Mark your calendars. We will send out invites uh, to this after. Um, we have JP hosting that coming up uh, with a representative from the city of Portland. Very excited to see that data set coming through um, and uh, having that uh, demoed. So yeah, look for more information on that as that comes out. Let's see here. All right, uh, announcements here. Tableau Conference is coming up. Uh, that is May 17th through the 18th, if you are virtual. Some of us here on the line are going in person. Um, if folks are going in person or have already registered, feel free to mention that in the chat. It would be really cool to have you guys meet up uh, when you're in Vegas and represent us. So yeah, um, feel free to register, uh, get that in advance. Um, and then you can take a look at, I think, content as that comes through. Um, yeah. And then, oh, we wanted to mention uh, last time, I, I wanted to mention that there were job openings at Nike coming up uh, as I transitioned over to IMDb. Um, I also have uh, positions open at IMDb uh, that I've put together on the Portland Community Message Board. Um, I've added that as a short link here, um, but we can add that to the uh, do to do to the chat, I think. Uh, I will do that in a bit. Um, but feel free to check that out as well as post if you have other things in there as well. Uh, Ryan, I saw you come off mute. Did you want to say something? Yeah, just just if anybody at their organization has job openings, this is a good place to post it is that community page there. Uh, and that's yeah, probably the most visible place. Also, you could post it in the chat if you wanted to in this call. Yeah. But yeah. Great. Let me post a link to that. Thank you. Um, all right. And then let me hop back in here. Without further ado, and above uh, in advance of my agenda time uh, by three minutes, I'm very excited. I'd love to present Chantilly Jagernoth uh, to take the floor. She is VP at Lovely Lytics uh, for visualization and training, as well as the CEO and founder of Millennials and Data, um, a nonprofit which y'all run to uh, show, to introduce folks to analytics in the working world um, through different coursework, which I think is very cool. Um, and looking forward to hearing more about that. But um, Chantilly is here today with expertise coming from presenting at multiple Tableau conferences. Um, and today she's going to share with us her dashboard design secrets. So uh, yeah, Chantilly, the floor is yours. I will awesome. stop sharing. Already, can you see my screen? Yeah, yep. awesome. Looks well, great. welcome everyone, and thank you all so much for having me. Um, today, I have the pleasure to speak to you all about design secrets for a non designer. And I like the title of this one, the business edition, because I presented at TC during the last conference that we had a couple of years ago. And I did the same presentation, but I did it around my personal journey while with these same tips and tricks. And what I got from feedback you know, from that conference was that a lot of folks wanted to see how they could tailor this to their everyday corporate dashboards. So today I'm here to present to you all how you can use these same design secrets and these design tips and tricks in your everyday dashboards. Uh, with that, I'm Chantilly Jagannath, Vice President of data visualization and training at Lovelytics. Uh, we are a Tableau partner company based out of Arlington, Virginia, and I'm also a four-time Tableau visionary formerly known as a Tableau Zen master. 
So I always like to start this presentation by saying I personally do not consider myself a designer. And to show you why I don't consider myself a designer, I have to take you back about 12 years to where I first started using Tableau. So I started learning Tableau at Howard University. I was a student uh, and my professor provided us with an assignment and just said, make sense of this data. It was movie data. And we didn't know any other tool to use besides Excel at the time. And if you tried to open this data set in Excel, it would crash your computer because it was a million records plus. So the assignment was due the next day and I still hadn't done it. So I simply went to Google and, and typed in what could analyze large amounts of data. And lo and behold, I ran into Tableau. I took the data set. I watched maybe one or two YouTube videos at like three o'clock in the morning. And these were the very first Tableau visualizations that I ever created, presented them to the class the next day. And as you can see, I didn't even take off the sheet for a header at the top. But lo and behold, I, I really enjoyed learning the tool that night, right? Um, I decided that I wanted to make Tableau my thing. I wanted to become a subject matter expert in it. And over the years, I picked up different tips and tricks uh, from working at Johnson & Johnson and Comcast and now Lovelytics. And these are some of the visualizations that I'm able to create today without having any formal graphic design training or any formal Tableau training as well. So the goal of today's presentation is to show you how you can go from some of those really starter visualizations that you see on the left hand side to more compelling visualizations like you see on the right hand side. So here are the five design secrets. First, I think most dashboarding projects start with requirements. I'll say about 90% of them, 10% usually start with just an exploratory analysis. But for this example, we're going to walk through how do you effectively gather requirements when you're starting a new dashboarding project? How do you then go and create a template based off of those requirements versus going into Tableau and just starting, starting to build out worksheets? So how do we go about creating a template? Then how do we use icons and art to our advantage? How do we pick colors strategically? And then how do we simplify the font process? So those are my five design secrets that we'll talk about today. The first one, gathering requirements. The first thing you want to do when you're presented with a new dashboarding project is you want to make sure you understand the overall goal of the project. You want to make sure you understand exactly what your end user is looking for and that your dashboard accommodates that in the end. Next, you want to understand your audience's analytical maturity. Is the person that's going to be using the tool familiar with Tableau or are they familiar with a different business intelligence tool? Are they familiar with just exporting visualizations into PowerPoint or in the form of a PDF? This is super important because you never want to be in a situation where you're creating something for an executive who's never used Tableau before and you make a really interactive Tableau dashboard and now they're stuck and they don't know how to use it. Uh, so you always want to make sure you gauge your audience's analytical maturity before you start building uh, your dashboard. Next, you want to understand your end user's preferences. What colors are they looking to incorporate? Uh, do they have different logos that they want to present on this? What size are they looking for? Is it going to be an auto size dashboard? Just imagine if you created uh, a dashboard that was all floating and in the end, your end user says, hey, we actually want to auto size this dashboard, All right, The pain that it's going to take to now adjust from floating to tiled. So always make sure you understand your end user's preferences uh, pretty early on. Next, you want to take all of your end user's requirements, refine them, and prioritize them. Have a conversation with your end user and determine what are the most important requirements? What are things that we specifically want to see as a visualization versus things that we could possibly have as a filter? Not everything that they require is going to have you uh, build out an actual visualization for it. Next, do a high-level data discovery. You never want to be in a situation where you start building out dashboards and then for one of the requirements, you just don't have the data for it. So once I gather my requirements for my end users, I also like to make sure I have a conversation with them or with the data engineering team to make sure we have all of the data that we're going to need to be able to execute all of those requirements. Then last but not least, start to think about the views that you're going to need to answer the questions. I always say that end users sometimes have a picture in the back of their mind of what they expect a chart or a dashboard to look like, but they just never relay that information to us as the developer. So I always like to ask them, you know, are you familiar with seeing this as a line chart, a dual axis chart, a bar chart, a highlight table, just to gauge exactly the type of visualization that they're expecting for a particular requirement. So to help organize all of that information, I've created a dashboard requirements document, which I'll share with you all at the end, that allows me to outline the dashboard, outline all of the requirements for the dashboard, and then outline all of the requirements for each of the views that we're going to need. 
So on the left-hand side, we have information about the dashboard. Who's our audience type? What are our display modes? What's our use case? And then are there any additional filters and notes that I should be aware of? And then on the right-hand side, we have our view requirement. So I think I consider a view in Tableau one worksheet. So what's it gonna take to build out that worksheet? What are the dimensions? What are the measures? Um, what are the calculations that we're gonna need for some of those uh, dimensions and measures? Do we, do we need to format this a particular way? Should we filter this data source or filter this particular worksheet? Where's the data coming from? And then under the additional notes section, that's where I usually like to note if the user wants to see this as a particular chart type. So to show you all how I use this document, let's look at a use case. The VP of sales wants to keep track of sales generated within the company. Overall, he or she wants to know how much each region brings in and which segment generates the most revenue for each region. Currently, this information is provided in an Excel workbook and shows sales per category, sales per segment, monthly sales, and the number of orders. The goal of our new dashboard is to create an interactive dashboard that analyzes the company's sales data that can be shared with the regional leads as well as the VP of the sales team. We want to know which subcategories have the highest sales, what are the sales per region over time, what are the sales profit and profit ratio for each region, what are the sales per state, and which segment and region have the highest sales. So here on the left-hand side, I've taken that high-level information from the VP and I've outlined the dashboard requirements document. Our audience will be that executive, so the VP of sales, as well as the regional leads. Our display mode will be a laptop and we've even specified the device size. Our use case will be a web or a PDF, meaning that we could possibly have a scrolling dashboard. And then for our filters and notes sections, we've noted the different dashboard filters we need to incorporate, the company colors, and then we've also attached a link to a dashboard that the VP liked that she came across on Tableau Public. Then on the right-hand side, what I've done is I've taken just one of those requirements, the metric details per region requirement, and I've outlined everything it's gonna to take to build out that worksheet. Our primary dimension, our regions, our primary measures will be customers, order, sales, profit, and profit ratio. For notes and calculations, we've noted exactly how to go about calculating customers, orders, and profit ratio. Then for the data source, I'm noting exactly where this data is coming from. And under the additional notes section, we're saying that the user will prefer to see this as a text table. Now, remember, we had a list of requirements. So for every single requirement, we're going to need a new view requirement document. So when, all, when we bring it all together, we're gonna have about seven different sheets that now outline exactly how we should go about creating this dashboard. So next, I don't just go into Tableau, bring in the data and start building our worksheets. I actually take those requirements and I start by building out a template. The first thing that I do with my template is I'm making sure that I'm prioritizing those requirements and I'm only using what's important. So by prioritizing the requirements, you're having that conversation with your end user and you're asking them, what's your most important requirement? Because you wanna put that requirement at the top of the dashboard. And then the least, require, least important requirement, you possibly wanna put in the bottom right corner of the dashboard. So here, after the conversation with the VP, we've noted that the overall number of customers, order sales and profit that's gonna be our most important requirement, followed by monthly sales per region, metric details per region, region segment sales, sales per state, and then our, le our least important requirement will be our sales per subcategory. Then from there, we're using either text boxes in Tableau or a wireframing tool or even pen or paper to organize and outline exactly what this dashboard is going to look like. Here are some of my favorite tools. Obviously with Tableau, we can create a new dashboard without even having to build out any worksheets and we can use text boxes and align them with borders and lay out exactly what this dashboard will look like. Balsamic is a wireframing tool that I like to use to depict visually exactly what this dashboard will look like in the end. Figma, I like to use for more modern dashboards. I like to build out my templates and use uh, drop shadows with boxes and export that as an image and import it into Tableau. And then Ninja Mock is another wireframing tool, very similar to Balsamic. And with that, uh, you can once again, just outline exactly what the dashboard would look like and then go about uh, using Tableau to create it. I personally don't use it because I use Balsamic, but I do know other designers that use Ninja Mock. So with the Tableau template, as I mentioned, you're creating a new dashboard and you're taking text boxes, which are just dashboard objects and you're placing them onto the canvas. 
And you're just providing context for the worksheet that's gonna go in place of that text box once we build it out. So we're just organizing our thoughts using a plain dashboard. Here's an example of a balsamic wireframe. With the balsamic wireframe, we have a little bit more of a visual representation of what the end result is going to look like. For these two dashboards, I had different ideas of how I wanted to lay things out. And we know that reformatting things in Tableau could take a few hours. So with balsamic, I'm literally just dragging and dropping using copy and paste to organize my thoughts before I go into Tableau and now build out each of these worksheets. With Figma, I use this for more of a, a modern look and feel. You can create dashboard backgrounds and import them into Tableau. You're adding drop shadows, you're using white space, um, and you're just taking this exported image from Figma and you're importing the template uh, into Tableau. You're building out all of your worksheets and you're placing it on top of this uh, background. The only downside is that with the Figma background, all of your Tableau uh, worksheets must be floating, or you have to have a floating container that you're then placing on top of your dashboard. So that's the only downside to using the Figma background. Next, as I'm building out my template, I'm making sure that I design to a grid. If you think about like newspapers and magazines, everything is in like a grid or a column like format, because that is the easiest way for your end users to consume information. So think about that as you're building your dashboard as well. You wanna make sure that the processing time is very quick for your end users as they're consuming your dashboard. So here's an example of a five chart grid. So even though we have an odd number of charts, what you'll see is that the two charts at the bottom, the sales per state and the sales per subcategory charts, those line up perfectly with the two charts above them, right? So here we're still designing to a grid. Here's an example of a four chart grid a three chart grid. As you're building your template, also think about ways to incorporate bands and add context to them. Bands are big aggregated numbers. They provide uh, summary information about a particular metric, right? So our entire dashboard is looking at regional sales. And somebody's gonna ask the question of what's the total sales across all of the regions? Now, if you're familiar with using grand total bars in Tableau, you'll know that having a grand total bar on the same axis as your other bars are gonna skew them to the left. So instead, what you can do is instead of using that grand total bar, you can simply use a band or a big aggregated number to show total sales without breaking it out by region. Because bands provide just intro numbers, you wanna make sure that they are positioned in areas of your dashboard that your end user's eyes will first look at, like the top of the dashboard on the left. So typically I'm placing those bands as standard numbers at the top on the left. There's an example of a left-sided band. And here's where you do not wanna display your bands, right? You don't wanna display them on the right side or at the bottom because your end users are gonna look at a dashboard top to bottom, left to right. And having it on the right or at the bottom, these are gonna be the last places that your end users eyes will see. So make sure you're placing your bands at the top or on the left-hand side. As you're creating your template, also make sure you're using size and position to show hierarchy. So the first thing that I typically do when I'm creating my template is I try to gauge exactly where I'm gonna incorporate filters if we have a dashboard that's gonna use filters. We know that when we place worksheets on a dashboard and we have filters, they're gonna come in on a vertical pane on the right-hand side. Now, personally, I do not like that vertical pane because it takes up too much real estate and your end users will see that and they're just gonna wanna add more and more and more and more filters. And we know that filters can hinder performance on a dashboard. So typically I'm either placing the filters in a drop-down container using a button, a show high button in the top right corner, or if the end user insists that we show the filters all at once, I'm placing them horizontally underneath the dashboard title area and right above the band area so that we're limiting the number of space or the amount of real estate that we have to accommodate filters. Then from there, I'm proceeding to build out the dashboard based off of the order of priority of those requirements. So your most important information should be in your left-hand side, your top left-hand side, and your least important information should be in your bottom right corner. And as you're building out your template, Think about ways that you could start to use icons. Where are we gonna place icons at uh, within our dashboard? And we're gonna have an entire section dedicated to icons and how to place them. Typically I'm placing icons for my filters and my export buttons, as well as my band areas. But because people think you know, icons look really neat, sometimes they try to place icons everywhere on the dashboard. And you don't wanna do that because you know, too much of a good thing you know, isn't so good. So you wanna make sure you're placing your icons 
strategically. Try to place them at the top of your dashboard and not everywhere you have a chart on your dashboard so it's not distracting. And once you have your template, go ahead and fill it in. So here we're building out each of the worksheets in Tableau. We no longer have to think about where to place these worksheets as on the dashboard because we have a template that's telling us exactly where to now place these worksheets. It's definitely speeding up the development process overall. And now we have a clean looking fill in the end. Here's another example of a Tableau template that was created for an employee turnover dashboard. We built the template you see on the left-hand side, built out all of the worksheets that you see on the right, and it was a pretty quick process. Here's an example of a balsamic wireframe. As I mentioned, with balsamic, you have a, a better representation of the end result of your dashboard. You can see exactly what it's going to look like. So here, I, I moved a couple of things around based on the spacing that I had within Tableau. But all in all, everything is pretty much laid out exactly as you see it in the balsamic wireframe. Here's another example of filling in a balsamic wireframe. Uh, what's neat about this one is that I actually didn't have time to build out the final dashboard, but I did build out the wireframe, provided it to another consultant within Lovelytics, and she was able to use the wireframe that you see on the left to actually construct the dashboard that you see on the right. So these are our template guidelines. And if you, once you have a good template, reuse your template, especially if you work for a really large organization, start to build out templates um, within your org so that you know, new developers, they can have a starting point, right? Especially for newer consultants at our organization, we always give them templates so that they have something they can start off with for our clients or for your users, it helps familiarize them with how to go about accessing and moving around a Tableau dashboard. So with this, on the left-hand side, our users know, regardless of the use case, you have an HR one on the left, a sales one on the right, they know that on the left-hand side, they're gonna see our refresh date. They're gonna see some filters. They're gonna see some high-level information. Then on the right-hand side, they're going to see uh, the bands at the top and they're gonna see their charts. We're in a grid-like format as well. So if you have a large organization and you're trying to get your users to adopt to Tableau, try to consider building out templates that can help familiarize your end users with Tableau. So layout, fill in, and reuse. So using art to your advantage. Using simple images and icons can take your dashboard from basic to visually appealing. So the first thing you want to do when you're selecting icons for your dashboard is you want to make sure you pick icons that communicate meaning and are easy to recognize. Typically, if you see a home icon on a dashboard, that means you're going to go back to the home page. An info icon means you're going to learn more about the, the dashboard. A data source icon means you're going to learn about the data source. These are things that your end users don't have to think about. You never want to have an icon on your dashboard that your end user has to say, hmm, what does that mean, right? So always pick icons that communicate meaning and are easy to recognize. On this dashboard, we're using four icons within our band area. For our customers, we're identifying them with a simple person icon. For our orders that were shipped, we're using a box. For a sales tag, we literally use an icon that says sales. And then for our profit, we're using one bag. These are things that our end users don't have to really think about. Next, if your end user has to have an interaction with your icon or with anything in your visualization, make sure you're providing labels or mouse over or just adding context for that uh, interactivity that they have to have. Just never assume that your end user knows how to interact with something on your dashboard just because you built it that way. So for a home icon, you either have a, have a mouse over that says click to return to the main page or explicitly write that out in the text next to the, to the icon hover for more information about the dashboard or hover for more information about a data source. In this example, four of our icons are within our band areas and our band labels kind of provide the context for these four icons. However, for our filter button in the top right, we have a mouse over that's available for the end user to see as they mouse over that area. But you didn't know that for that Tableau conference logo that you could actually click on that and go to the home page. So you want to either have a mouse over in that area or a tooltip, or you want to explicitly say click to go to the conference homepage. Next, when you're picking icons, make sure they are simple. You don't have to have really creative icons on your dashboard because the smaller those icons are, 
the harder they are to see. So have simple icons on your dashboard, nothing too creative. You don't need a house with windows, doors, you know, two stories, uh, outline of a doorknob, things like that. It looks cool, but it's gonna be really hard to see on a dashboard. So in this example, we have a simple person, simple box, a simple sales tag, a simple money bag. But if I were to change those icons to, you know, something a little bit more creative, as you can see, it's hard to see on the dashboard. Yes, it's easy to see in the image on the left-hand side because they're larger, but on the dashboard, we're always minimizing the size of those icons. And as we stated for our first point, you never wanna have icons where your end user is asking like, what does that mean, right? So try to go with really simple, um, not too creative icons on your dashboard. Next, if you have icons that are in the same real estate area, and I'll explain what I mean by real estate area on the dashboard, make sure the style is consistent and cohesive throughout. If you have all solid icons, like in our first row, make sure they're all solid. You don't wanna have one icon that is shaded a little bit different because it's gonna stick out like this data source icon does on the second row and like this info icon does on the last row. Let's look at this example. We have a band area here. All of these are in the same real estate area. This filter icon is in its own real estate area in the top right corner. So everything within our band area should have the same look and feel, right? As you can see, the customer icon is a solid icon compared to the other ones, which are silhouette icons. And as you can see, it kind of just sticks out. So make sure that all of your icons in the same real estate area have the same look and feel to them. Also make sure that your icons follow the overall dashboard theme and color scheme. Just because you have certain brand colors in your color palette doesn't mean you have to just randomly use them on your dashboard and definitely not for your icons. Our dashboard is purple and gray, so our icon should be purple and gray. We don't need to use a red, a green, or a blue icon just because, right? Just because we want to add color. No, just make sure you're going with the overall dashboard theme and color scheme. In this example, the blue, the teal blue that is being used for two of the icons, that's a part of our, our, our company color palette. However, we're not using that color anywhere else on our dashboard, so we definitely do not want to use them for our icons. And then make sure you're reducing the icon graphic details. Your graphic details are just lines and curves associated with your icon. And this goes hand in hand with picking icons that aren't too creative. The more lines and curves you have associated with the icon, the harder it is to see it once it's on a dashboard and it's really small. So definitely make sure you're reducing the icon graphic details and going for more simple icons. On this dashboard, all of the icons, they have the same color scheme. They all are silhouette icons. However, they have a lot of lines, a lot of curves, a lot of detail. The smaller they are on a dashboard, the harder they are to see. So reduce those icon graphic details. And yes, you can use icons for business dashboards. I do this all of the time. Typically, as I mentioned, I'm placing icons within the band area or for my export buttons. What I want to call out with this particular example is that if I didn't have the Lovelytics blue and green logo in the top right corner, then I would not feel comfortable using green icons within my band area because that logo is the only place that I have the green. I would probably stick with like either blue or gray icons. In this example, what I wanna call out is that if you look in the band area here, we have three icons, they all have circles behind them, right? It wouldn't make sense for me to just have one icon in this area that doesn't have a circle behind it. So this is making sure you have the same look and feel once again for your icons in the same area. With this particular dashboard, I think we have three different real estate areas. On the left-hand side, we have our webinars panel which lists the upcoming and the previous webinars. All of the icons in that real estate area have the same look and feel to them. In the center, we have our band, uh, our band area and all of those icons have the same look and feel. And in the top, we have our filters and our export buttons and all of those have the same look and feel to them. Here we have a marketing dashboard. All of our icons in the top right corner for our filter and our export buttons, all of those have the same look and feel. All of the icons on the dashboard follow the overall dashboard color scheme. And then we have those icons once again in this area that have the same look and feel to them as well. And if you're wondering where you can get some really neat icons from, Flat Icon is my favorite site. If you sign up for a free account, there's a really large gallery of icons that you can select from, download, and even edit for free. If you look at this visualization here, the two icons that you see at the top, those were not the original colors of those icons. So with Flat Icon, once I signed up for a free account, I was able to edit the colors of those icons to match my dashboard color scheme 
download them and incorporate them all for free. I also like the Noun Project, which isn't free. I think it's $100 a year. And then Icons 8. And these are our icon and art guidelines. So choosing colors that matter. The first thing you wanna do when you're selecting colors for your dashboard is you wanna make sure you're letting your brand color form the basis. So what do we mean by the basis of a dashboard? We're talking about your titles, your headers, your labels, and your icons. You wanna pick one dominant brand color. Hopefully it's not a red and you wanna use that for all of your titles, all of your icons, um, anywhere that we're gonna like highlight on our visualizations, right? So mostly like our logos, our titles, our numbers here and our icons. In this example, we're using our Lovelytics Blue uh, for all of the uh, titles and then for our band area and we're using this green for all of our icons. Here, we're using this dominant blue for our band area, all of our titles, and then we're using the dominant orange for all of our icons. Next, if you're stuck on how to color your visualization, it's okay to get inspiration from art and other visuals that are out there. I do this all of the time. Uh, Pinterest, uh, Dribble with three Bs, as well as Tableau Public. Those are my favorite sites to go to to get inspiration from. So for this particular example, I needed to create a ticket sales dashboard and I actually didn't even know where I wanted to start with this. So I came across a visualization you see on the left-hand side uh, on Tableau Public and I like the look and feel of it. So I was inspired by it. I took bits and pieces of it and I ended up creating a visualization you see on the right-hand side. With this particular dashboard that you see on the right, um, I actually came across the viz on the left-hand side on Pinterest once I typed in modern dashboards and I like the look and feel of it. I like the drop shadow. I like the color scheme that was used and I took the bits and pieces of that and I created the visualization that you see on the right-hand side. With this visualization, I needed to figure out a way to incorporate about five different dashboards into one without having your standard Tableau user interface, right, with the tabs up top. Uh, so here, I saw that this visualization on the left had drill downs up top as well as on the left-hand panel. So I took that same user interface and I incorporated it into the visualization that you see on the right-hand side. Next, as you're selecting colors for your dashboards, limit the number of dominant colors. You don't wanna use more than two dominant colors. And a dominant color is anything that is uh, not like a white or a light gray or a really neutral tone color. So in this example, our only dominant color is the purple that we're using. You see the color palette has four different dominant colors because this gray is kind of neutral, but we're only using one throughout the dashboard and everything else is a neutral color. It's either light gray or it's white. For this example, we're using two dominant colors. We have this dark blue everywhere for our titles, as well as within our band area. And then we're using that orange to highlight strategically on all of our charts. And here's an example of what you do not want to do with, with colors, right? You don't want to just have a bunch of random colors on your dashboard just because they're a part of your brand color palette. You want to be very strategic with your coloring. And I'm going to talk about how you can be strategic with your colors. Um, in this example also, sales is the only thing we're representing. So why would we wanna color sales for different things? Why would we wanna color it orange, pink, as well as purple if everything is looking at sales? Next is you're creating colors. Uh, make sure you create accessible color schemes and you test them. What I like to do with the finished dashboard is I like to take that dashboard and I like to plug it into a color blindness simulator because we always have to make sure that we understand that as a developer, everybody is not gonna see the dashboard the same way that we can. So we need to accommodate for that. So once I plug it into this color blindness simulator, what I'm looking for is anywhere I'm using color to highlight the maximum or to show different shades of something, I wanna make sure that somebody who might have a color blindness deficiency can still pick up on those different tones and those different shades. And as you can see with this example, they can. Here's another example where even though the color is changing drastically for a red week, red blind, green week, and green blind, because I'm using neutral tones, the gray, or excuse me, the black and the white, and I'm using the red to highlight and draw attention to, the users are able to still uh, pick up on that regardless of the color blindness deficiency that they may or may not have. And here's an example of what you do not wanna do, right? Everybody loves that red and that green, but please uh, beware that everybody cannot see those colors. 
especially if you look at somebody who is red blind, right? They don't know if California or Texas is higher. So with this example, you probably wanna go with a different, a different color. As you're selecting colors and you're picking colors for your worksheets, use color purposefully and for reinforcement. So in this example, we're using color purposefully. We're only using that purple for our worksheets where we wanna highlight when necessary. So our spark point, our map, when we wanna highlight the maximum for our uh, table on the right-hand side, our highlight table where we wanna highlight the maximum. We're using color with purpose. In this example, we're using color for reinforcement. We're reinforcing the maximum value for each of the charts. So here, maximum value is highlighted in blue bars. And even though in our bottom chart, the maximum value is at the bottom, because we reinforced that the blue means maximum at the top charts, when you're looking at the bottom chart, your eye automatically just picks up on that blue and you know that that is the maximum value. Here we're using color purposefully. This is an investment comparison dashboard. We're looking at two different tickers and how they perform. We're making sure that the colors stay consistent throughout. So we have one ticker that is represented in blue. We have another ticker that is represented in gray and we're keeping those colors consistent. And typically what I'm doing is I'm actually designing my dashboards in grayscale first, which I'm about to go into uh, on my next point. And I'm using one dominant color to highlight everything on my dashboard. So you'll see a lot of the dashboards I create, you have gray and a dominant color, like gray and blue, gray and orange, right? So how do we design in grayscale first, right? And believe it or not, all of my dashboards look like this uh, once I start the, the design process for them, right? So after I build a template, I don't worry about formatting my worksheets until I've compiled my dashboard. So all of my dashboards are bare just like this. And the first thing that I do is I pick the colors for the title, the filter, and the band area. And remember, we're letting our brand color form the basis of our dashboard. So we're going to use a dominant color for our band numbers, our icons, as well as our chart titles. Then we're looking at each chart individually, and you're going to ask the question, is there anything that I need to highlight, right? So for our spark point, our line chart here, the spark point is something we probably wanna draw a little bit more attention to. So we're gonna add purple to that. Next, we have a text table that looks at customers, order, sales, profit, and profit ratio. Five different metrics right there. When you have five different metrics, you're probably gonna need five different colors, right? You never wanna have two metrics with the same color. And we don't wanna have a dashboard with five different colors on it. So we're gonna leave that one alone. Now, the one to the right of that is looking at sales, and it's looking at it per region and per segment. So we'll add some color to that. Next, we'll look at our map in the bottom left-hand corner. We have a lot of dots on the map, right? And we're not even using size for those dots. So we'll probably just use color and highlight the states that have the maximum values and the states that have the minimum values. And then our sales for subcategory chart in the bottom right. If you think about our requirements, remember that the bottom right corner was our least important requirement. So do we wanna add a dominant color to all of the bars for that chart if it's our least important? Uh, chart? No, because a dominant color is going to draw attention, and we don't necessarily want to draw attention to our least important requirement. So we'll leave it as a neutral color. Then from there, we're going to add some final touches. We're going to look at our worksheet titles, our dashboard footer colors. We're going to test different shadings, borders, colors, things like that, and we're going to come up with our final design. What I see a lot of end users do are they use these really dominant colored borders or these really dominant colored shadings. And if you're a user that do, does that, I will state that you're adding noise to your dashboard. It's okay to section out your visualization, but you wanna use a more neutral tone to do that. You still see the sections there and your visualizations are what's uh, speaking in this instance versus with something like this, those dominant colors are the first things that your end user's eyes are drawn to. If I look at the chart on the right, the first thing that draws my attention is the sales per region dark shaded bar here versus with something like this, uh, you can focus your eyes to go chart by chart and see exactly what sticks out versus you know this chart header sticking out to you. So use neutral colors for your borders. And those are our color guidelines. Now let's talk about fonts and wrap it up with fonts. The first thing we wanna do is we wanna make sure we're selecting and sticking to one legible font. And your best font is probably gonna be your company branded font or just a standard tableau font. You wanna make sure you're using just one font throughout. And the best way to use one font throughout your entire workbook is to select format in your toolbar within Tableau, select workbook and pick your font uh, on the format panel that's gonna appear on the left. 
So make sure you're legible, your font is also legible. This is a neat dashboard, but what you'll see here is that that font is definitely hard to see, especially for our band labels. So make sure you're just picking one legible font for your entire dashboard. Next, you wanna use no more than four sizes of that font type, and you wanna be very consistent with your font sizes. These are the ways that I break up my font sizes. My dashboard title, my worksheet title, my chart header, as well as my worksheet pane and my additional text. So what I'm doing is I'm making sure that all of the dashboard titles in my workbook have the same size. If I have multiple uh, dashboards in one workbook, all of the titles have to have the same size. All of my worksheet titles where it says sales per region, sales per state, sales per subcategory, all of those have to have the same size. And I'll tell you right now, I do not use the default size 15 that uh, comes with all of these worksheets once you place them on a dashboard. I usually use about 12, that's, that's probably my happy medium. All of my chart headers have to have the same size. So where it says central, east, south, and west, and all of the different subcategories, those have to have the same size. And then any labels or anything that's on my marks card for all of my worksheets, I make sure all of that text has the same size as well. So consistency throughout with your font sizes. Try to avoid custom fonts if possible, especially if you're using a font that is not available on your internal server or just not available with Tableau Online or Tableau Public. Reason being is because if you design with a font that's just local to your system and you upload it to Tableau Online or Tableau Public, it's gonna render as a different font. So the best way to get around that is to use a Tableau Online compatible font. The one that I have highlighted is the one that I'm using within this dashboard, but these are some other compatible fonts that you can pick from as well. Next, you wanna be sure that you're strategic with your fonts and your background colors. If you have a white background and you have colored font on it outside of like black or a dark color, you wanna test that for contrast accessibility. If you have a color background and you have color font, you definitely wanna test that and make sure that is that there is enough of a ratio between those two colors for somebody who might have um, an issue with contrast accessibility so that they can actually see uh, the difference between the number or the, the color text and the color background. So to help with that, I use a tool called accessiblecolors.com where I'm able to plug in my text color, the smallest size of that font. I'm able to plug in my background color and test for AA compliance. And this goes with the web content accessibility guidelines and the ratio that they specified for AA compliance. If your test fails, uh, this tool can provide you with a background color that you can change it to or a text color that you can change it to. So that's why I really like this one. So here's an example where for this COVID dashboard, the mustard color that you see there, it's on this blue background. And I wanted to make sure that there was enough of a contrast between the smallest font size, which is where it says versus prior day, and this blue background. So I plugged in all of that information. And as you can see, it passes. However, if I were to dar darken that mustard color, that yellow, it would not pass. The tool provides me with two new uh, colors that I can now use uh, so that it does pass that ratio test. Here, blues and grays, some of the hardest colors to see, right? So if you're using blue and gray, you definitely want to test it. In this example, it passes the blue uh, that is being represented in the paragraph here. Remember, always go for the smallest size, uh, passes on that gray background. But if I were to lighten that gray background, it would not pass. And the tool provides me with two new examples of what I can use for the background color or for the text color. Next, uh, when you're working with fonts on your dashboard, you wanna use color or bolding techniques to emphasize anything you wanna draw your user's eyes to, especially if you have large bodies of text. If you have a large body of text on your dashboard, never assume that your end user is going to read the entire thing. I can tell you that if I was your end user, I probably would not read the entire thing unless you bolded particular things within that uh, paragraph. So here we're simply just bolding and coloring things we want our end user's eyes to pick up on as they're skimming this dashboard. As you can see on the left-hand side, if I took away that coloring, you're just assuming that your end user is gonna read this about section versus if you simply just highlight some of the key stats or the key words within the paragraph, you have no choice but to see those things as you're skimming the dashboard. And last but not least, if you have large bodies of text on your dashboard, always align left, stay away from center and right alignment. So with this particular dashboard, we have a large body of text, which is anything that's more than like three or four sentences, aligning left, the about the visualization section. Versus here, if we were to center align it, what you're doing is you're forcing your end user to pick up on where each of the lines begins 
and we where each of the line ends and it just adds a little bit more processing time. So always a line left for large bodies of text. And these are our font guidelines. So in summary, uh, start with your audience and their requirements, build your template and add your views, incorporate design elements that will enhance your story, add color strategically, icons for charm and use the rule of four when selecting fonts. And remember, anyone can be a designer. It's not something you're born with. It's not something exclusive to a select few. All it takes is practice while keeping a few design secrets in mind. And with that, I am Chantilly Jagannath. If you would like to contact me, here is my email address as well as my Twitter handle. And if you would like to download the uh, document that I shared earlier, you can find it at designsecretsforanondesigner.com. And thank you all so much. And I'll open it up for any questions that you all have. Fantastic. Chantilly, thank you so, so much again, just for taking the time out and sharing this with us. I have been eating up all of your words while we're going through this and like so many things where I'm like, I do that too. Like, thank, like, just like confirmations or like, um, more like, why do I do that? And like putting the why behind it. So this is great. Um, we do have some questions in the Q and A. Um, I can go through, uh, those as well. And there's been conversations in the chat too. So um, let's see here. First question, what is the average and greatest number of days or hours you have spent on a single dashboard? Uh, the greatest, uh, probably 120 hours. Um, and that includes doing it for, that includes like wireframing, building out various calculations and building it for desktop mobile as well as a tablet device. So probably 120 hours is like the largest project that I've worked on um, consistently, like as a, as a consultant. Now for my own stuff, like because I just come back to work, definitely some months it'll take me to, to build out a, a dashboard uh, if, when I do it in my free time. Right on. Um, okay, how... How can you design a dashboard to be easily and accurately read via a screen reader? So there are uh, a couple of blog posts that are within the community that talk about accessibility and how you can design dashboards for that. I'm actually going to follow up uh, with you all and provide you with some of those links because there are definitely some uh, Tableau visionaries that are doing the work around accessibility and trying to show how you can create more accessible dashboards. I'm particularly not an expert in it. And when I need to understand how I can make my dashboard more accessible, which I'm actually working on a project for right now, I just refer to those links. So I'll provide you all with those links. That's amazing. Thank you so much. And that's great that there's people out there like spearheading that movement as well, because it's such a thing that I feel like it gets gets overlooked or pushed for other priorities in requirements. So this is, it's great that that's it's such a call out. So um, yeah, I don't know. Are there other questions in the chat? Questions from our, our leaders that they want to ask? I don't know. I don't have to hold the mic the whole time. Uh, we have, you are Tableau Visionary Chantilly. I don't know if you can see all the, the hype Thank and the you. props in the chat. Um, but you're you're getting so much praise and recognition there. Um, Danny, sorry, I cut you off. You were going to say something. Um, I just saw someone post about um, the decision to not use a diverging color palette and just using one color. Mm -hmm. Wanted to see if you had any advice or thoughts in that. So I always go back to the purpose behind the two color palettes, right? So categorical color palette is always used for showing dimension colors, right? So that's when you definitely want to use that type. Divergent color palette is always or should always be used when you have something that ranges from negative to positive values, right? And now sometimes I, you know, would go the route of using a divergent color palette with all positive values. But if you're doing that, then do note that you're doing the wrong thing, right? When you're using a, a divergent color palette with all positive values, it's specifically supposed to be used for negative and positive values because the change in color represents like that change from zero over to negative and to the positive. And then a sequential color palette should just be used for all positive values. So I use it, but it's just, I use it very strategically. Yeah, you gotta, gotta know the rules before you break them. Exactly. <laughs> I love that. Um, I was just scanning the chat to see if there were other questions. Um, I really like the idea you had about like um, 
creating the wireframe and then handing it off to junior to like design and sort of training them to do that. Yeah. Um, have you seen like mature like sort of um, inst uh, organizations with their own like sort of brand guide for wireframes that they can hand off or um, like templates that they share amongst different analysts? So we work with a lot of organizations to actually get them to that starting point, And then we design to what we designed. Um, but there are instances where some large organizations have templates already built out. And then we are uh, working with their developers to design and stick to that. Um, outside of that, personally, I would say that coming into Lovelytics, we did not go the route of creating wireframes. But I'll say once we started creating wireframes, we saved so much time and so much money on a lot of our engagements. Because before we start an engagement, we're making sure a client signs off on that wireframe. And we'll have minor iterations to the wireframe, but everything is in scope at that point. We visually have everything that's going to be in scope. We know exactly the amount of time it's now going to take to build out everything. Um, and if a client decides to change from that, then we have a justified reason as to why we would want to uh, ask for like more hours. So I always say if you're not building out uh, wireframes and you're always like running over hours on a project, consider going the wireframe route. Um, I wanted to, I had one question and then we can go over to the chat again. Sorry, we, I know we're getting close on time. With Tableau Conference coming up, are there things that you typically look for when you go into conference? Uh, uh, things, things that you should that look for for content? I, for, well, this year I'm I'm not speaking, so most of the time it's uh yeah I, I, most of the, most of the time um I spend like running around for like speaker type of stuff. But so this conference, what I'm looking enjoy forward this to, one, yeah, like uh <laughs> I like going to the sessions on what's new, like in Tableau, some of the features that I still need to learn more about. So like with LODs, when LODs were first introduced, I was going to all of level of detail calculations. I was going to like those types of sessions. Um, I go to a lot of use case sessions because I work in consulting and we touch all types of industries. So I like to look at different industry use cases and see how they're using financial data because that's always a hard one in Tableau, using financial data in Tableau. So I like to see what they're doing. I like to look at like healthcare. So I pick you know, just different industry topics. And I, I like to, to look at those. And then I support a lot of like my community friends and their presentations too, because I've made friends over the years in the community. So I always just make sure to pop in and see what they're doing and tips and tricks. Uh, tips and tricks is always a good one. The speed uh, tips and tricks battle. Um, I love that one because I always learn something new, uh, even though I've been using Tableau for 12 years. So that's another one I'd recommend. 100%, right on. Um... That's awesome. Now I know what I'm looking for. Uh, let's see here. We do have other questions popping in. Um, what about a sequential color palette with a greater range of values, light yellow through orange, through red, through dark brown? Um, with something like that, you're probably going to do a calculated field that actually has a categorical color palette associated with it and you're specifying exactly when to use those colors because if you don't then you're just using the magic that Tableau is doing behind the scenes to categorize each of those so you'll probably want to go for a categorical sequential color palette in that instance okay and then my mouth is, mouse is being finicky I can get half of Heather's question out oh I got it uh, I what do you think about dashboards that have a lot of text for example Rule, one rule I've heard for business dashboards is that there should be written out actionable insights. Should XX, excess text like that be hidden away and hover over icons? Oh. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I believe in using hover icons as well as drill down. So whether the collapsible container feature in Tableau, I use that all of the time. So if you want to have like a large body of text, either put it in an icon or in, an info icon and highlight the information, or you can put it in a collapsible container where they click on like a grid button or something or a text button and it expands and takes up the dashboard. And then they also have the ability to close it. But I never think it's okay to just have a large body of text take up a lot of real estate on a dashboard. Yeah, that's a lot of, a lot of pixel space wasted. Yeah. Um, we do have a few more questions, but I do want to be mindful of your time, Chantilly, because I know it's the end of your day there. Uh, uh, thank, thank you for you calling in yeah. from the East Coast. Um, yeah. And Thank you for taking the time to share everything with us. This has been amazing. Um, and we will uh, post the link to download the uh, the 
PowerPoint because there are so many helpful links in there, um, especially your contact information. So I guess if we missed your questions, please feel free to contact you there um, or hit us up on the on the Tableau, uh, our Portland page. So then uh, it can be posted. Um, yeah, thank you once again. I have learned so much from this conversation. Um, I know on behalf, I want to say that on behalf of everyone else because I'm sure someone everyone has walked away with something new today so yeah absolutely. Um, I can answer a few more questions so okay okay I'll count uh which of the new things in 2020 or later uh or later versions do you use so what newer features have you kind of fallen in love with something I use all of the time parameter buttons like parameter actions with parameter buttons and um, being able to instead of having like the parameter drop down, actually import a data set that has more of a button type of look and feel and then incorporate a parameter action uh, with that. So that's one of my, my favorite features as well as the uh, collapsible container, like the add show show high button that that's, I think that was 2020 maybe, um, but I use that all of the time as well. And the export buttons, download to PDF, PowerPoint, PNG. Those are game changers too. <laughs> right on. Um, okay, and then what are the greatest limitations to the stories that Tableau Viz's can tell? I feel like that is a very open-ended question. <laughs> limitations. Um, the underlying data, the why sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, with a lot of visualizations, you're, you're more so making uh, an observation and less of an insight kind of. And when you want to drill into something as a newer user, you're not gonna be familiar with like view data and look at the underlying data behind it, right? And there are just certain features that you probably don't know how to use. So getting to the why of a question that you might have, you might see something highlighted or an outlier on the chart. I think just having that visualization and not understanding the why or the explained data uh, capabilities behind it is one of the greatest limitations for viewers, right? Us as developers, we can always right click and say explain data, but on the server, that's not a functionality that I think your end users can have. So they might be left with wondering why is that an outlier? What are, what are the reasons that could possibly be, you know, an outlier? I love it. You've got a list of people quoting you from today. So that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, once again, just thank you so much. I don't know if there's anybody, any other questions um, open in there. Um, wanted to remind folks about next month's call on uh, April. Uh, JP, remind me because I can't. I I don't remember. Nineteenth. Uh. <laughs> April twenty first. I lied. It's the 21st. Thank you, JP. Uh, <laughs> um, and don't forget to sign up for Tableau Conference. Um, if you are going in person, feel free to reach out to. There's a bunch of people on this leadership team that are going in person. I am not, uh, but I uh, will be celebrating virtually. So <laughs> um, thank you again. Uh, I don't know. Take care until next time, y'all. <laughs> awesome. Thank you all. Enjoy your thank day. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks.